Okay, so we are recording now. So welcome again to CE 526. Uh, this is our, our second class session. And there are a few things that I, I did uh, do. I did post a link for a playlist on YouTube that essentially covers where I'm gonna, and on that playlist, I'm going to post all of our lectures. So that would be one resource where you can sort of refer to it. And, and one thing that I do wanna add is that as we cover content, I'm hoping that I'll be able to sort of point out where we are covering some of the stuff like timestamp on the video, where some of the content you might be able to find like specifics of, okay, we discussed, we started discussing human factors at this time span, stamp and so forth. So, so if you are the first one watching, I might not have the timestamp. So I will actually appreciate if you could drop that timestamp in comments sec section uh, of that video, that'll be really helpful to me. But my plan is to have every video sort of not annotated, but in the description of the video, add a timestamp number to where you can find certain content. So that's something that I'm planning to do. I did receive some of your comments about best and worst practices, and, and those were helpful. Uh, and thank you for that, uh, whoever has submitted. If you haven't had a chance to submit, it's not a mandatory assignment. So, so it's okay if you don't submit anything. But if you do want to get in something that caught your eye as as you were that caught your eye as you were uh, taking these online classes, uh, please go ahead and submit that. I think some of the things that I've noticed are are things that were you know th that are best practices in any class that we do, uh, any classes that we teach, which which is welcome. Obviously, I would rather hear that feedback now versus at the end of the quarter in your formal feedback. So hopefully I would have addressed some of those things. So it's good to have that reminder right off the bat. So I will try to be, for example, be consistent with, um, with the deadlines and so forth uh, and, <clears throat> and, and try to be upfront about what, what are some of the things that you need to go and read up on and so forth. So, so that, that's something that I could, I could take care of. But if there are things that you haven't yet entered, uh, please, uh, you're welcome to do so at, at any time. Uh, until the end of the class today. So, so that's basically the deadline for that so that I can sort of summarize what I need to do uh, throughout the quarter. So please go ahead and do that. And I'll give you some time, like we'll have some time uh, during the break uh, in today's lectures when lecture when we can do that. Okay. And uh, I haven't had a chance to post the link uh, to download the R Studio, but I'll do that uh, before the end of the class today, so I'll have a link to download our studio on PC and on Mac. If you haven't done, so, it's not a very specific place where you have to get it downloaded. You can look it up online and so forth. So it's not a huge thing, but, but if you do want to uh, wait for my official link, I, I plan to do that before the end of the class today during one of our breaks. So I will go ahead and do that. And uh, yeah, so what I'll do now is that I will take you to what our week one content is. I'm gonna go ahead and, and go there now. One second here. Um, <clears throat> So what I'm trying to do is this canvas here. Sorry, I have too many tabs open. Okay, here we go. So, <clears throat> so what we'll do is we'll get started with uh, the human factor guideline, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Do high floating meeting control. I'm going to go ahead and open the main meeting page. Oops. Okay. 
So our first topic that we're discussing is on the human factor guidelines, right? And, and this is based on this, this report here, NCHRP report 600A on human factor guidelines. And the context of all of this is that, you know, we talked about a little bit at least about the idea of nominal safety, right? So the idea of nominal safety is that are you addressing all the design relevant design guidelines that are specified for designing a roadway location or an intersection or an interchange or whatever. So any facilities that you design are those meeting that minimum design specification. So that's your, um, you know, trying to meet that nominal safety. But nominal safety, adhering to nominal get safety guidelines is sometimes not enough. And and even if you do adhere to all the guidelines, you might end up in a situation that might still be crash prone. And to make it even more safe, the first step is to kind of look at how potentially a human being might interact with that situation and kind of making it a little bit even more user-centered design. So, so trying to go a little bit above and beyond what is specified in the design guideline. Okay? So, so what are some of those things that we need to do? And your reading assignment for this lecture is that what I would like you to go ahead and do. So, so, so your reading assignment typically will be due on the Tuesday of the week when we have to finish that uh, topic. So, so for this reading assignment, I'll clearly specify the deadline would be uh, the 12th of January. So please finish up this reading and assignment by January 12th. Okay. So this reading assignment is, is basically all lists the sections of the human factor guidelines that you need to read. And what I've done is I've curated some of the content from this, because if you look at the whole thing here, if you look at the whole human factor guidelines NCHRP report, which is this one, I hope you're all seeing it. So if I click on this, so this is a 4.4 MB PDF. And if you download this, this is 146 page long. And I'm not expecting you to go over 146 pages, of course. My goal is for you to review some of the curated content that I talk about in the reading assignment. And as you're reading through that, that reading is my hope is that would be sufficient for you to make sense of anything that you might have to review from these guidelines. So this is, that is just a sampling of content from this. So if you look at this human factor guideline, so I just want to talk a little bit about your reading assignment. So if you go over this, so the way this guideline is set up, it's, it's coming out of the research program for the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, uh, human factor guidelines for roadway systems, so this is collection A. And then if you look at this, any chapter in there, so what I've done is like what you what I will be reading is that what is the purpose of the human factor guidelines for roadway systems? So I'm going to talk about it some, but I want to make sure that you are also are able to read through this content and start to make sense of that. Okay. And then what happens is that for every, if you look at any of these sections on this. So, so let me take you to an example. Uh, so they talk about site distance guideline and they don't have all the guidelines yet when this was published. So for example, this is an, based on ongoing research. So they didn't finish the chapter six and chapter seven and chapter eight. So those are all forthcoming at the time, but they expect to retain similar formats for that. So, so that's gonna happen there. So for example, if you look at chapter 11, you'll see engineering countermeasures for red light running. So if you go to any section here, so let's say if I go to section 11-2, so, so if I go to page number section 11-2 here, go ahead and download this. So if I, if I, and I didn't even have to go to 11-2, you can go to any, any of these sections. So any of these sections here, are designed based off of, so they will have like an introduction to the idea. So this would be typically be the introduction to the design standard. 
Yeah, so the part that I've highlighted here is going to be the introduction to the design standards. It will essentially take content from the ASTO Green Book or your MUTCD. So this will be the design guideline. And then there will be a sliding scale. And I want you to pay attention here. And, and if you're not paying attention, if you're on some other tab or if you're looking at something else, I want to give you maybe 20 seconds to come back to the classroom content real quick. This is, this is very important for you to understand. Okay. So I hope you're all back paying attention. Uh, so if you look through any chapter, so they will provide an introduction, they'll provide the formula that is from the design guideline. And this is directly from the Ashto Green Book. And then they provide this sliding scale. Understanding this sliding scale is very, very important because this is where they look at the design guideline and critically evaluated that guideline to figure out, is this based primarily on expert judgment? So if you go to the extreme left of the guideline uh, sliding scale, those things are based primarily, those guidelines are based primarily on expert judgment, okay? And then as you move right, so for example, if you look at this one, this is based primarily on the empirical data. Okay. So, so, so you can see that this sliding scale goes about five sixth or five sixth of the way to the right. If you look at, so five sixth of the way to the right. So this guideline is primarily based on empirical data that have been collected. Not all guidelines are like that. There would be some guidelines in this document where they will be based on uh, more, um, you know, more on the expert judgment versus not. So, so there is that sliding scale also help researchers look for where more research might be needed. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to go ahead and open my human factor guideline. Are you guys seeing the guidelines real quick? I want to make sure. So could you let me know via chat window? Okay, so I see some thumbs up here. So you're seeing the full PDF now on your screens. That's great. So what I want to do now is I want to do uh, quickly, I want to look at some of these guidelines. So basically what I'm trying to get at is, so there are some chapters, and then once you get to site distance guidelines, so this is the first guideline they provide, the site distance guideline. So what I want you to look at is, I want to look at the site distance guideline that I'm seeing on the screen. So this is sort of key components of the site distance. So this is what they're talking about. What is the key components of site distance? So site distance, the design guideline is that the key components are two components. And this is something that you are very familiar with from 321, our fundamentals of transportation engineering class, right? That site distance, and we talk about it in traffic engineering, this is a very, very fundamental element of this. That site distance is based on distance traveled when the driver perceives and make decisions about and intimates the action in response to a road element, that's your PRT, what is called the perception reaction time. And then when the driver, let's say, applies the brake or whatever, it reacts to the situation, then there will be a distance traveled while the driver completes an appropriate maneuver. So those are the two components of the design guideline. What is, what is the key components of the side distance? Right? So these are the two components. Can you look at this siding scale and tell me in the chat box, in your judgment, is this based on primarily on expert judgment or is it based on empirical data? So in the chat box, I want each of you to type by looking at this sliding scale, is this guideline based primarily on empirical judgment? So just type the word empirical judgment or expert, I'm sorry, expert judgment or empirical data. So what I'm gonna do now is come back to here. So I see some chats already uh, coming in. Yep, this is based on mostly empirical data, that's right. So this is something that you guys now are familiar with is that you guys are seeing that this is primarily based on empirical data. Why? Because you can see that the sliding scale goes up to here. Okay. So now you can basically look at this and figure out, you know, whether it's so now. So one way to think about this is that if there is a human factor uh, or if there is a design guideline that's based primarily on empirical data, it is more trustworthy, right? Because you've verified that with 
uh, with empirical data. So this this is great. So so I guess uh, so you guys are, are are looking at this, and then this type of scale appears if you look through this document on everything, and you will see that some of these well-established guidelines that you might have learned in CE321 and CE421, if you've taken that class, you will see that a lot of those are in fact based primarily on empirical data. But I wanna find something real quick here as, as we go through this. You can see that, see this one? You, you, I hope you're seeing the scale. So this is intersection site distance. So if you look at intersection site distance, they talk about where they're getting that from, and from Ashto Green Book. And then look at this one. So this is sort of 50-50. If you can just do a quick thumbs up and let me know that you can see that this is 50-50. This is sort of the sliding scale only goes up to here, right? So, so this is a way to sort of evaluate anything that's provided in this document. You can look at any guideline that's given here and then figure out whether this is based primarily on expert judgment or empirical data. Okay. So what I want you to do is if you go back to your if you go back to your <clears throat> reading assignment here, go back to the reading assignment that you have to work on on the 12th is is you have to look up these 5, 8, 5, 10, 10, 10, 11, 2, 11, 4, 11, 6. So these are some of the things that, that I want you to, to read up on in addition to the sections of the, of the handbook. So what you'll do is like there are some that are sections and then there are some, these 5, 8, 5, 10, 10, 10, 11, 2, 11, 4, and 11, 6. These are some of the case studies. So then, and these case studies are basically about when to use decision site distance, looking at the passing site distance, uh, accessibility for vision impaired pedestrians at roundabouts, engineering countermeasures for red right running and restricting right turns on red, and then heuristic for selecting yellow timing intervals. So these are some of the things that I want you to read up on. So is everybody clear on the reading assignment? Any questions about that? I'll give you maybe another 30 seconds or so to come up with any questions you might have. You can ask via audio or via the chat box. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm seeing no questions here, but which is which is fine. I just want I'd be very happy if there are no questions because you got everything versus you're not paying attention. So I hope you are all paying attention. And um, okay, so what we'll do now is that if everybody's clear on what they're doing with the reading assignment, what I'll do is I will go to our formal lecture now. So I will go ahead and open my PowerPoint or my, my Google Slides now because I do everything via, via the Google Slide. So I'll sort of, Look at it. And I'm go, going to the present mode here. Is everybody seeing the slide? <clears throat> okay, perfect. And I'll give another 20 seconds or so. So if you were, because I was talking the same thing or what, for whatever reason, if you were distracted by something, I'll give you like maybe 20 seconds or so to come back to the class here. So this is our first material lecture, and we'll talk about the, the reading assignment from that. Our, our, our reading assignment sort of flows from this, and this is a summary lecture of the whole guidelines. And, and once you hear the summary lecture, it'll kind of make your task easier when, when you're doing the reading. So what are, first of all, try to define what is a human factors. So human factors are, they're not specific thing to traffic safety, by the way. So human factors is an applied discipline dedicated to enhancing the relationship between devices and systems. 
and users who are meant to use them. So human factors, if you kind of dig deep into the study of human factors, you will find that human factors are a big thing in computer science. So in hardware design, for example, you know, your smartphone, smartphone manufacturers, they're big on human factors. Your website designers, they're big on human factors. You know, because the goal is to figure out how majority of users interact with the system. And, and there are things in human evolution that affect how we interact with certain things. So for example, our peripheral vision is sometimes impaired by certain things. And as we age, we don't see very well on the side of our eyes versus what we see straight. And that has implications for how do we allow folks to make left turn on intersection or whether we allow folks to make left turn on intersection on a green ball light or uh, a cautionary yellow arrow or not, right? Or whether or not we provide protected phase and intersection. So obviously human factors affect traffic systems design. But what I'm trying to tell you is that if you study human factors, that's a discipline that has implications way beyond just traffic safety. Okay. But obviously it is a big thing for traffic safety because as we learned, there is a big chunk of crashes that can potentially be avoided if human beings are able to react in a timely manner. And, and, and I gave you that sort of somewhat misleading 90% crash statistic in our previous lecture when I was talking about how even though the last causal event in the chain of events that led to a fatal crash or a crash itself includes human error or includes human reaction, there was a much more detailed study by NCHRP that kind of put that number at about 50%. So 50% of fatal crashes in the US have driving error as a contributing factor. So, so that's, that's a more realistic number. But, but even so, like, you know, some of those things could potentially be avoided if we are able to improve on the design guidance that is provided by documents such as the MUTCD, such as the AASHTO Green Book, right? So that sort of is the purpose of studying human factors is that where, what we can do to the design potentially by even, even looking at costs of the design. So how we can improve the design without improving a lot of the crashes, or with, I'm sorry, without improve, without increasing a lot of the crash. I'm sorry, uh, skip that, I'm gonna repeat. So the purpose of studying human factors is that how do we improve the design while accounting for human factors, but not increasing the costs by as much, right? So that will be our goal as we look through these human factor guideline book from the NCHRP is that how we can improve the design to be more user centered so that we can avoid some of these crashes that have driving error as a contributing factor, but still not increase the cost of design by as much. And cost could be a big consideration because obviously things could be much made much more safer if you, if you throw a lot of money at it, but sometimes we don't just don't have the resources to do that. So, so again, um, we have to balance all of this by cost thing as well, but sometimes addressing these human factors could be a thing where you, it doesn't actually require spending a lot of money. It just requires keeping a human-centered or user-centered way of designing things. Okay. So that's, that's something that we have to kind of think about. And, and you know, I think about human factors and I want to relate it to something that I saw in some of the things that you provided today in your feedback about best practices for an online or a virtual class. You know, some of you mentioned that there should be consistent deadline, right? So deadline should be the same Monday or the same Tuesday. And that's actually a very good point. But what does it relate to? We are re able to react to things much more consistently if we see the consistent deadline. If the deadline is sort of all over the place, it's easier to miss that deadline. What is that about? That is in fact about human factors. That's how users react to it. So, so when I design my assignments, when I design my, my course, 
I have to have the users in mind. And, and, and that is another, if you think about it, that ideas, those ideas that you're providing in terms of the best practices, a lot of them actually relates with human factors. I hope that makes sense. And, and I will give you one more thing about how these human factors could be important. It's that sometimes when our, you know, when as traffic engineering community, as a professional community of traffic engineers and transportation engineers, a lot of times the facilities are designed, it makes a big difference if the people who are designing it are what mode do they use? So, so sometimes these human factors guideline could be, or, or user-centered design could be much more improved if you have folks who are designing the system actually use the system in a multimodal fashion. So it, it helps to have engineers and planners that have used multiple modes that have obviously almost everybody drives, but then if they have been a bicycle rider, if they have been a pedestrian on that facility, then they can provide a much more uh, improved system that is appropriate for all mode users and not just for the drivers. And, and that, so, so some of these guidelines that you will see in this human factors are trying to address that question as well, is that a lot of time, the transportation engineers or planners that design the system are primarily drivers themselves. So their user point of view is very, very automobile centric. And, and some of the, having a guideline document like this can help them, even if they, they might not be users of multiple modes, they might not be bicyclists or pedestrians themselves, it can help that, uh, it can help them bring that perspective into the systems design, and which, which might be hard to get if you're not yourself a bicyclist or a, uh, or a pedestrian, um, you know, if you're a professional who's not a bicyclist or a pedestrian. So I hope you got a broader understanding of why studying human factors is important for traffic engineers, but also an appreciation of the fact that human factors are a discipline that affect a much broader set of things than beyond just traffic safety. Okay. So can I get a quick thumbs up on, if, if you get a, some understanding of why, why human factors are important for traffic safety, for multimodal users, and also why it's a much broader um, much broader discipline. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'm seeing some thumbs up. I'm not, certainly I'm not seeing all, but, but I hope, uh, so I hope folks who are not on camera, I'm not asking you guys to turn on your cameras or anything like that, but folks who are not on camera, I hope they're still here and listening. That's always uh, something that, uh, that, that, that's on back of my mind and sometimes it distracts me. But, but yeah, so again, this, I'm not, certainly not, not trying to uh, have you guys turn on your cameras or anything, but uh, occasionally I would like a virtual thumbs up just to, just to get that um, feedback that you guys are still here and still listening. Perfect. Okay. So let's go to the next slide here. So what is the background? And I already provided some of the background of that human factor guidelines from, from which your reading assignment is based off of. It is the published resources to aid in safe uh, roadway design and operational decisions. It, it includes the MUTCD. It includes the uh, policy on, on uh, geometric design of highways and streets. And it includes the highway safety manual itself. So, so there are published resources. And we sort of go beyond that. Like, how do you use these published resources to improve some of those guidelines that might still be based on uh, primarily maybe expert judgment? And how do we enhance those guidelines to do a more user-centric design? Because there are several uh, you know, limitations. And so, and, and you guys already have some experience with you guys already have some experience by looking at the design guidelines. I'm sure in CE321, we'll talk a little bit about the Ashto Green Book. 
you know, when we talk about slight dis side distance briefly, uh, when we talk about breaking distance and stopping distance and all of that, could you, and I know if you just sort of, because you have access to these slides because I try to do that before the class. So you can obviously click through that and, and get the list that I provide on this slide later on. But you, could you take a minute and, and on the chat box, based on your understanding and not, not looking at my list, and this is not a graded assignment, but, but if you can take maybe like a minute or so and think about what are some of the limitations of just, if you just adhere to the design guideline, what are some of the limitations that you can think of on your own uh, of just sort of designing everything by standard and not worrying about these human factor guidelines or substantive safety and things like that. So, so what are potential limitations that we are trying to address with these human factor guidelines based on your understanding of what we have talked about in this class very briefly, of course, in past lecture and a half, but then also what we have done so what you might have learned in, in CE321, or if you've taken the traffic engineering class CE421. So can you, and, and I, the slide says on paper, but maybe it's a good idea to just sort of write it on, uh, on uh, not write it on paper, but on, uh, on chat box. Could you give me some limitations? of those on chat box. I see one already appearing there, that's great. So I don't want you to look at this. I don't want you to look at the screen here. So I see four of the responses. Yep, so there are some, some good ones there. Really good ones. Uh, so I'm seeing outdated data. That's that's pretty good. Your scenarios may not exactly match the one published on the guidelines. So this is great. And I have one uh, from from Brian here as well, which talks about if you and, and and that's from experience. I'm sure that if you just look at the guidelines, they might not account for everything that that's on there. Uh, they need to be changed periodically. Obviously, yes, that's the case. Some roads have special conditions. Each location is different. Uh, public doesn't like the design idea and demand a different one. So, so that, yeah. So, so sometimes you know there might be folks who are who might have different experience, different needs, and so forth. Vehicle design changes, and then that, that's great. Unusual terrain, yeah. Yeah, specific. Yeah. So there might be facilities that have a different set of users. Maybe your intersection location is located near a senior center or something that you might have to um, count for that. Uh, and you know there might be some atypical weather conditions and you might need some way of ameliorating those. So those are all great points. So, and, and you know, there might be some things that we might not be able to account for even after looking at this and some unpredictable human behavior and we might not be able to get to all of that. But, but these human guidelines certainly help you avoid some of these errors. So, so this is great. Thank you for providing these, uh, uh, providing these conditions. And then, yeah, so there are, there are places where you can actually uh, you know, avoid some over-designing as well. So this is, this is great. Some of these design guidelines might just be too conservative. And, and that's, that's a great point too. And, and one example of that is that if you look at the, and I'm not sure if Caltrans has updated this, these guidelines, so, 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 because one of you mentioned in chat box, there might be some, you know, you might be over designing because of certain guidelines is, is, a, is a great point too. And I'll have a, once I look at all the responses. So, so this is great. Thank you for your responses. So I'm gonna tell you one thing that relates to one of the responses that came in about over designing for worst case conditions. And this is something that, that I, I heard from some Caltrans folks uh, up until at least a few years ago, if you're familiar with the passing distance, passing site distance guideline on, on two lane roads, right? So, so there are 
uh, and you might have seen that some, on some two lane roads, especially in rural areas, you have these solid markings, lane markings that separate the two directions of road. And so, so you'll have these solid markings, solid yellow lines, that means you can't pass. And then sometimes there will be like broken lane markings or, uh, and those markings at those locations you're allowed to pass. So, and, and, and you might be also knowing that Caltrans has different highway design guide manual, design manual, highway design manual than the ones that they have uh, for Ashto Green Book. It's very similar, but it's just different. So one of the guidelines that was different was that because it was based on the lower object height, Caltrans's guideline for providing no passing zones was different than uh, the Ashto Green Book, which was much more conservative. The Caltrans's guidelines was much more conservative. So their no passing zones had to be much larger on a two lane road. And what they were doing, what the Caltrans engineers were doing is that based on the latest research, they were citing the Green Book research that was going in the national documents and they were getting approved these design exceptions year after year after year to, and they had to do that every time because the highway di design guidelines were different. And, and once you look at the object height being different, and accounting for where the human eyes is going to be in relation to that, they could actually get away with much more lax design standards and they could provide ability to pass at much longer sections, but they were not able to do that just by the design guidelines. So they had to sort of justify every case by case basis. They had to write those design exceptions and, and they got approved and everything. So they did not, they designed it the correct way and not in the more conservative way a lot of the times but it still took resources for them to be able to write those design exceptions. So again, so these, the, you know, accounting for these human factors in your design guidelines could be, could be much more valuable. And in some cases it could actually lead to cost savings and providing a much more efficient design. Uh, and and you know, obviously still be safe, but, uh, but even, you know, sometimes it can even help you not just achieve a safe system, but can also help you the other way around providing a much more efficient system. So I'm going to kind of click through my guidelines here that I've listed here, and you could take a minute to review those now. And I know some of those got already mentioned. <clears throat> so I see pretty much all of those got mentioned in the chat box. So I wanted to kind of review this for a minute or so, all of this list. And is there anything that's not quite clear to you? Please let me know. So I'll give you maybe another uh, minute or so to kind of review all of these guidelines or all of these reasons for, for why do we need these human factor guidelines? And if there are some things that's not quite clear, you could you let me know why I'm asking a question? I'll grab some water in the meantime. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions. Here so far. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide here. <laughs> So this slide talks about all the components of the highway system that we have to, when we're trying to design safe systems, we have to, to look at. So there are users that are using an automobile, there are users that are using maybe large trucks, and then you have the user that is a pedestrian, 
And then there are like lane markings that are part of traffic control. And, you know, there are, there are traffic control signs on the road. And obviously this is a, a much simpler environment because I'm not showing you an intersection. I'm just showing you a roadway system or roadway segment and not an intersection. And as you enter, enter an intersection, the components of the highway system become much more complicated, but this is a simpler roadway system where you have these different types of users, different types of uh, traffic controls, but it's still a relatively simple system, which can get much more complicated if you are in a roundabout or a traffic signal uh, where you have intersecting roads, maybe some driveways and so forth as well. But, but think of this as a simple sort of maybe an arterial road where you have different types of users, some minimal traffic control and, and a road. But even here, you have multiple components that you need to address as you're designing the system. So different types of users, the roadway design and the traffic control. So the example problems that you might encounter or, or that might be addressable using human factors include, so look at the first one here. Drivers experience difficulty at intersection in estimating the gap size and speed of the approaching vehicles, right? That's a classic human factor problem in thinking about, and what is the key implication of this design? Like, like if you look at this problem, what is the design problem that results from this? If the driver experienced difficulty at intersection in estimating gap size and speed of approaching vehicles, what type of decision that you might make as a transportation engineer or a traffic engineer that is affected by this problem? Can you start typing in the chat box real quick? What type of design decision will be effect, affected by this first problem? What type of design decision would be affected by this first problem? If the drivers experience difficulty at intersection in estimating gap size and speed of approaching vehicles. Yeah, intersection side distance, yeah. So yes, the intersection side distance will absolutely by, be affected by this. That's correct. And then ultimately, it'll, if, if the intersection side distance is affected, that will, like if you have a signalized intersection, for example, that will absolutely govern whether you need to provide protected left turn or you need to provide, uh, per, you can provide pro permitted left turn. So obviously these types of things. And then let's look at the second one here. Drivers experience problems in detecting a sharper curve after negotiating several longer radius curves. And this gets to the point of, you know, this gets to the point of a design consistency issue. If you have been experiencing mostly mild curves that have longer radius, and remember longer radius is better, right? Because for a straight section, the radius is infinite. And those are obviously easy to navigate. And as radius goes down, that's when you need to navigate the curve. A sharper curve would have a much lower radius. And if you have been encountering curves that have very large radius or you've been encountering straight segments of the road and you suddenly end up in a situation where the curve is large, you have to adjust your speed. So you might need adequate warning before a curve. And you might have seen those warnings on the road, right? So if you're driving on 101, um, there's obviously there are sharp curve warnings, there are like a regulatory uh, or advisory speed signs in yellow boards and so, so on and so forth that are there to give drivers an indication that this might be a little bit of a different environments that you need, environment that you need to navigate. And then additional distance and time that are required to slow or stop under adverse weather condition. So sometimes there are roads that have, uh, you know, slippery when wet type of warning, when there are like, you know, uh, when there are, uh, you know, so, sorry, when there are slippery when wet and the road may, 
you know, and sometimes the IC bridge warnings and so forth. So those are provided to account for adverse weather conditions. And then the next one is the excessive messages on changeable message sign can inhibit correct decision and traffic flow. So bright light sources, whether from vehicles and roadside property can cause glare, user blinding and possibly loss of vehicle control. So, so you wanna, so you, if you have changeable message sign, you wanna be judicious in what type of warnings you provide through those changeable message signs, because that could be potentially harmful if you're providing too many messages or too many uh, different types of messages and so forth. User decision-making takes time, but users can only react to about one to 1.5 information tasks or actions per second. So, so again, you don't wanna overwhelm the road users. That's something that is overall is the message that you could have technology like changeable message sign that can be helpful. But if you overwhelm the users, that can cause problems. <clears throat> so one idea is this idea of the most meaningful information. Right? So this most meaningful information is the MMI. <clears throat> And let me let me kind of go back to real quick onto the hide this meeting controls and and go back to this NCHRP report here. So this idea of oops, let me go back to this idea of the most meaningful. So the idea of, so what I want you to do is like to go through the idea of most meaningful information. I want you to take a minute and read the paragraph that I'm highlighting here on the screen. I hope everybody can see it. Let's read through this. Paragraph. So take a minute to read through this. So the idea of this is that when you're navigating a roadway environment, you're seeking for most meaningful information. That most meaningful information is not a fixed thing for every segment of the road, right? As you're scanning the environment, it depends on, first of all, whether you are a driver, whether you are a pedestrian. So the, the information that might be most meaningful to you as a pedestrian might not be the most meaningful information when you are a driver. Right? So, so every road user will have a different information that's most meaningful to them. And then also, as you scan the environment, there would be different things that, uh, you know, that, that become most meaningful. And what I wanna show you here So if you look at the slide that we were talking about, this slide. So if you look at these green items here, so this was an experiment that was conducted um, by researchers that developed this manual, this user manual, or, or the 
the human factors manual. So they asked users as they were, as they drove down this location, they asked user to rate what is the most meaningful information, right? So this is the same roadway location, by the way. So this is the same roadway location. They asked folks to rate which is the most meaningful information to you on the left picture and on the right picture. Okay. So, so if you think of this, and then if you look at this sliding scale of colors here on the left or on the bottom here, on the left bottom, if you look at the green dot, that is typically will be thought of as the most meaningful information. So, so most drivers said, I paid attention to this item. And then as you move right, fewer and fewer people treated that as the most meaningful information. So, so you could say on average, anything that has green shade or light green shade or yellow shade is, um, was treated as more meaningful information by the drivers versus these purple and red shades. They were treated as less meaningful information. And gray and blue were sort of in the middle. So what do you notice in those two pictures? And you could probably look at this if you're not seeing this picture very well on your, uh, on your <clears throat> slide here on the Zoom screen, you're welcome to go back to your, your classroom slides or on the Canvas page and download, I mean, and look at these Google Slides from there. But what is the difference? What is the difference between what is the most meaningful information on the left picture versus on the right picture? They are the same exact location, pretty much same time of day. But what's the big difference do you see in the most meaningful information? You can type that in the chat box, please. What is the biggest difference in what you see to be the most meaningful information? In the two picture, so if I want to be more clear about the question, I'm asking you, what is the big difference between the concentration of green dots that I told you are the most meaningful information for both pictures? Where is the concentration of green dots in the left left picture versus on the right picture? Seeing already some responses on the chat box. Yeah, the oncoming car to the right, right? So that basically becomes. So if you have a car coming, right? So you need to make sure that that becomes the most important information, right? So, so this, is, this is very important is that if there is a, something changes in the environment, the most meaningful information would change. And what are the implications for us as designers? So, so that's one thing that they noticed is that in one of their studies, they found that driver perceives the spot, uh, sorry, the speed limit sign to be a very, very meaningful information, whether it's because of the fear of getting ticket or whatever. If you see a, spot, a speed limit sign on the road, that drivers treat that as a very meaningful information. So you have to be careful as to where you put those speed limit signs, because you know that the drivers are gonna treat that as most meaningful information. You wanna make sure that that's not a distracting item from them, for them that distracts them from something else that might be even more important from a safety perspective. So that's another thing that came out of the research was that they looked at the speed limit sign, they found that that was a very meaningful information pretty much regardless of the context. Obviously people pay attention to the oncoming cars and so forth, but they also still pay attention to the speed limit sign quite a bit. So you have to make sure that you put the speed limit sign on a road location where it doesn't take away attention from something even more meaningful, maybe a approaching curve or whatnot. Okay, that's great. So I, I, I'm glad you guys sort of picked that, picked up on that. So see, this is this is kind of the, the important thing I was talking about. So you look at this, you know, folks were, so many folks were paying attention to this speed limit sign and they were not looking ahead 
So, so a lot of these things were, they were trying to look ahead at everything, but obviously speed limit sign was important to a lot of folks, okay? And, and they were not looking at what's happening up front where there actually might be a side distance issue because of that approaching vertical curves, curve because they can't probably see what's up ahead of them. Okay? So maybe this speed limit sign is not appropriately placed because taking driver attention to that sp uh, speed limit sign versus kind of looking, looking ahead. Does that make sense? So these are the things that we try to address from human factors point of view is that where do we place these signs? And there are some guidelines that are available on the MUTCD, but not to the detailed extent that, that we expect them to be, uh, to be available. So I hope that discussion was somewhat clear to you guys. Any questions about this? Okay. So what are some of the best practices around designing safe roadway systems? So what you wanna do is you wanna become a virtual road user and avoid unintended use of the infrastructure. You wanna avoid inconsistency of design and traffic control applications. You wanna avoid large differences in speeds. You wanna avoid uncertain driver behavior. And then in this case, the traffic engineer we're gonna primarily be affected by once the operations part takes over. So traffic engineers would primarily be responsible for the operations of the roadway and evaluating the operations of the roadway, whereas the highway designers would actually design the roadway elements. So they need to work together and they need to be engaged as virtual road users. And this safe roadway system approach, so I want you to be kind of thinking about this when we do our, and I'll point this out as well, but I want you to be thinking about this when you, when you look at the safe roadway systems, when you, when you look at, uh, when you look at the road safety audit part of this course, a little bit later in the quarter, I want you to come back to circle back to this document as you review roadway locations for whether they are safe, and meeting the design standards. But I also want you to be thinking about as a road user of that system, do any of these problems exist at those locations? All, all these avoidable problems exist. And just adhering to the design standard may not always get you to those, avoiding those problems. So any questions about this so far? Take that as there are no questions here. Great. So this is again, you know, one thing that, that when you are talking about most meaningful information, you have to be thinking about what area of roadways is scanned in each step by the road user. So this, in this case, it's the driver, and how far they can actually scan the roadway environment. So, so they will be able to, so when they're located here, where they're located in the figure, they will be able to look at the step I. So this will be the first thing that they can scan. And as they move forward, as they approach the next point, they will be able to scan the second I plus one step and then I plus two step. As they're progressing on the road, they will be able to progressively scan the next segments. My question to you is, can you think of some factors can you think of some factors that affect this step size? How much area of the road can they can the road user scan? This area that is inherent in these rectangles. What is what are some of the factors that this area is based off? Again, please, could you provide some information in the chat box for me? What are some of the factors that this step side may be based on? <clears throat> so 
some responses here. Yeah. Weather is great. The side distances. How fast are they driving? Yep, that's very good. So your speed, grade, obstruction, terrain, geometry, really good answer. So you're sort of already getting in that frame of mind where you're kind of thinking about it as a user. And, and a lot of this will actually come from your experiences, right? I mean, if you have been a driver, if you drive regularly, you can uh, obviously come up with these factors and, and those factors are exactly right. And then you could, Categorize those factors, and then these are some of the factors that, that are listed in the human factor guideline document that I shared with you from the NCHRP research, but you can look at user, operation, highway, and the environment. So age, uh, and then you could look at, there are some factors that are specific to user, some factors specific to operations, some factors specific to the highway itself, and then the environment. And, uh, could you just take another, like maybe a minute or so to review these factors? And if there are anything that you want me to, to go over, if there are any factors that is not clear in terms of how they might affect the scanning step size, if any of these factors you're not sure about in how they affect the scanning step size, please let me know. Uh, maybe take another 30 seconds or so to review these. <clears throat> yes, I see something on the chat box real quick. What is the control type? That's a good question. So control type is operation. So this is control type will be your intersection, right? So whether it's a signalized control, unsignalized control, how you are, uh, control type would be like, you know, if there is any intersection. Uh, so you're mostly talking about intersection traffic control here. Uh, signal, stop sign, yield sign, roundabout, so forth. Thank you for asking that question. And again, please, uh, you can ask the question in front of the whole class. Or you can ask the question if you're not feeling brave enough, please feel free to type the question in the chat box anonymously and that's fine. That way is, is okay too. Okay, seeing no further questions so far. Okay, there's one more. Yeah, what is meant by land use? So land use appears in the environment. So land use is basically whether it's an urban environment or a rural environment. You know, if you have an urban environment, there might be things, more things that might be vying for your attention. There might be billboards, there might be uh, other road users, there might be more driveways, uh, there might be more things going on in an urban environment than in a rural environment. So land use basically refers to what is the surrounding area is used, used for, like is it urban, rural, suburban, and they would affect because you will have to scan more things in an urban environment versus in a rural environment. So that's what that refers to. Thank you for those questions. I really appreciate questions as they come in. And I feel like this is a little bit of an advantage over having an in-person class. I'm, I'm seeing some, some good questions come up that I haven't had you know, folks ask in in-person in classes, and, and that is great. So, so I really appreciate you asking the question and because this gives you sort of an anonymous mode of asking questions, uh, I, I, I think that might be an advantage for at least some of you who might not feel brave enough to ask the questions verbally in the class, uh, in an in-person class versus having a chat box option where you can even just have a chat, uh, you know, me uh, ask the question or just uh, at least send some chat message anonymously. So, so I really appreciate that about the virtual environment. You know? 
And obviously I would rather be teaching this class in person, but I'm just trying to find some silver linings here. So thank you for those questions, I appreciate that. Okay, so let's move on to the next thing. So, so some discussion of example guidelines. So what I want to do now is I wanna look at uh, the design guideline 11.4. And I believe this is about, this is one of those guidelines that is part of your, um, Um, you know, part of your reading assignment. So I want to, I want to go over one, a, a few of these. So let's go over and open up the design guidelines 11.4 real quick. And starting high floating meeting control. Go ahead and open 11.4 here. So this is signalized intersection. So this is a design of signalized intersection, restricting right turns on red to address pedestrian safety. So, so this is a human factor. There are obviously some guidelines that are available to us from, from human, uh, from, from MUTCD, for example. And you can see that this is not as based on expert judge. This is a, the scale goes up to almost four sixths of the way through. So based equally, so it's a slightly more based on expert judgment than, or slightly more based on empirical data compared to expert judgment, but not quite all the way through, obviously. So what I want to do now is I want you to take some time. I'm gonna take maybe a 20 minute break here. So off the break, I want you to spend maybe five to 10 minutes to kind of just walk around, take a break, get some water, go to the restroom, whatever it is you want to do, five, 10 minutes of that. But then I also want you to spend five, 10 minutes on just making sure that you kind of go over this write-up. And then I want to come back and talk about it when we, when we get back here. I want to talk about these guidelines. So I want to and you might not be able to get through all of this, but, but make sure that you get through some of this. And I wanna highlight how do you, and this going through that in the class together will also be helpful to us because it'll help to you as you wrap up your other reading assignments. So maybe we can go over one or two of these here today, and then you can read the rest of your own as part of your reading assignment. So let's do, uh, take a break and then come back in about, 20 minutes, so let's come back around, this is 9.20 right now. So let's come back around 9.40. And in the meantime, what I'll do is I will, so, so again, this is page 75 of 146, if you, uh, if you wanna look through that. And then what I'll do here is that I will stop sharing my screen right now. And I will also hit uh, stop on the recording. Or maybe I'll hit pause on the recording so we can continue pick up from here on the recording. Welcome back, folks. We are going to start discussing, uh, discussing the section 11.4. It's a case study, essentially, from, from the human factor guideline document that we've been reviewing. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And that's right here. So what I asked you to read is the section 11.4 and, and uh, or the page 11.4. It talks about restricting right turns on red to address pedestrian safety. Are you folks able to see my screen? Could you give me a quick thumbs up? Perfect, thank you. And it looks like everybody's good there. So I will just hide. Okay, so as you read through these, this is sort of the driving statistic behind all of this, right? Why do we need the restriction of right turns on red to address pedestrian safety is that there have been research that talked about how 40% of the drivers do not stop 
before, do not stop completely before making a right turn on red. So, so they are making essentially what we uh, commonly call the California stop, right? So they sort of slow down, but not quite come to a full stop and then make a right turn on red. And of the drivers that do stop, many will stop beyond the marked stop line and block the pedestrian crosswalk while waiting to turn. And that could cause problems for, for pedestrians. And then uh, because pedestrians may yield right of way before they enter, so they sometimes, they are not supposed to, but they sometimes might for their own safety, they might yield the right of way before entering the intersection and then they might not have enough time to clear the intersection before the signals changes. And, and that could be problematic for folks who might be a little bit slow walker if they are older in age or if they have some other mobility issue, that could be a problem for them. So what this guideline does then is disguise approaches for implementing restrictions on right turn on red. So when you should restrict right turn on red with the objective of reducing conflict between pedestrians and the right turning cars or vehicles. Okay. The MUTCD, that sort of is our guiding document here. The MUTCD, the Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices, provides six situations where RTOR should be restricted. And three of them specifically address pedestrians. So, so out of the six, three of them talk about pedestrians. First is where an excessive pedestrian phase exists. Exclu I'm sorry, exclusive pedestrian phase exists. <clears throat> so if there is a phase where you're only moving pedestrians, then obviously you want to restrict right turn on red at that time. Where significant pedestrian conflicts result from RTORs. So, so, so if, if you know that there are a lot of pedestrian crossing and a lot of right turn on, uh, on red happening. And then when there is a significant crossing activity by pedestrians who are children, elderly, or have disabilities. So there are some of the design guidelines that this document provides. Restrictions on RTOR can be used to reduce conflict between pedestrian and turning vehicles. The most effective method is to base turning restriction on time of day. So that they said is the most effective method. And that timeline, like, you know, if you're gonna have timeline, that timeline will depend on what kind of traffic do you expect? And these turn restrictions by time, time of day are fairly common. I recall in Santa Barbara downtown, if you've been there, a lot of restrictions on when you can make right or left turn, uh, depending upon the time of day. So these are very well accepted practices. So having um, these kind of countermeasures, it's not something that you could, you have to worry about. You could implement something like this. And then basing restriction on presence of pedestrian in intersection will also reduce conflict. So sometimes you could say no turn on red when pedestrians are present. But that could be, you know, that could be problematic. Can you think of a reason, and if you had a chance to read through this before, I hope you paid attention to this. So they note, like, if you look at the highlighted part here, basic restrictions on presence of pedestrians at the guide intersection will also reduce conflicts. However, this approach appears to be significantly less effective than time-based restrictions. Okay, so this is like this. So they will, you will do something like this. Uh, no turn on red when pedestrians are present. So you could look at this from here. So the second one on the on the columns in the second column when pedestrians are present. Why do you think the effectiveness is lower compared to time-based restrictions? Why do you think the restriction of, of which says when pedestrians are present is not as effective? as having a time-based restriction. <clears throat> okay, so I'm seeing some information in the chat popping in, that's great. That's exactly right. So 
So this is great. Divers are not expecting it. Yeah, so this is this is the correct answer. Like, you know, if you're basically relying on the drivers, they might not see the, uh, the pedestrian, but so it so leaves much more subjective judgment if you want to uh, summarize these concerns. When pedestrians are present, type of restriction leaves a lot of sub subjective judgment on part of the road users. Whereas if you just do it on the time, it's an objective thing, it's easier to enforce if it needs to be enforced and things like that. So, so those things are always much more effective that can be objectively enforced. So, so that's why it's more effective to have a time-based restriction compared to a restriction where it says, uh, you know, when pedestrians are present. Okay. And then some examples of different RTOR signage, right turn on red signage, most effective, effective with low to volume, low to moderate volume. So inside lane, so this is another one. Inside lane stop bar is set back to remove sight lines, to improve sight lines for RTOR vehicles. So I hope all of you can see why this third column, effective when sight distances are problematic. I hope all of you can see wh how, what's the benefit of having a, an offset stop bar. Right, because it's offset stop bar. Make sure, and you might have noticed these offset stop bar at intersection, right? If you, and what is the benefit of having this offset stop bar? Because that makes sure that this offset stop bar, the vehicle will stop a little bit further upstream, and they're not going to go all the way up to the sidewalk. And then the folks who are on the right lane, the driver who's on the right lane, will be able to notice the pedestrian coming in from, from uh, crossing uh, from the left of the page to the right of the page. And then, you know, so the last one is like, you know, having a sign lit up that says no, no light turned on red. So having those types of signs are, are very important. NTOR sign, red ball on, or uh, NTOR sign, it's more eye-catching. So basically making things more conspicuous, more eye-catching is, 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 is uh, you know, is useful here. So what I want you to do is like real quick, go over all of these things, all of these different countermeasures. There are like six of them listed here. So again, these countermeasures sort of go beyond what is listed in the MUTCD, right? So they are suggesting some countermeasures. And if you look at these countermeasures, they're not really expensive countermeasures. You know, all they require is like maybe putting up one sign or just one marking, some kind of pavement marking. So these are low cost countermeasures that can still improve pedestrian safety. And, and apply those human factors principles that we've been mentioning in this class so far. Okay? So what I want you to do is for next minute or so, next maybe two minutes, Look at each of these countermeasures, look at their key features, and look at the preferred application, and make sure all of those make sense to you. So nothing that, you know, that you're thinking, hey, that doesn't make sense to me, and I would appreciate if there are things that don't make sense, you just let me know that, hey, I would love for you to discuss this particular countermeasure or this particular key feature of that countermeasure or this particular preferred application. So let's take next two minutes to review these, this table here that's shown on your screen here, countermeasures, key features, and preferred application. And if there are any questions about this, please let me know. You can ask why a question via chat box. You can ask question via uh, you know, private chat, uh, or you can ask verbally. That you're welcome to it if you if you would prefer. And I'll give you up until nine fifty five or so to come up with your questions. So another couple of minutes. <clears throat>
I haven't seen any questions so far, but I hope you are still paying attention and looking at these things and making sure that it all makes sense to you. So it's time moving on to the next thing. So then they talk about some discussions. Then they, they provide discussion. So basically this first page, typically when you are gonna be reviewing these things, the first page we'll talk about these countermeasure examples. And then this will provide some discussion, some, you know, where are they? What is the empirical research that's backing up these, these, uh, these guidelines or these countermeasures that they're providing? So, so conditional RTOR restrictions, and then, and then relative effectiveness of different signage options. So there have been some research on that. And then another issue to consider is the use of electronic signings. This is a blackout, blank out NTOR sign that are lit only during the times that turns are restricted. They found that some research found that the NTOR blank out sign was slightly more effective, although more costly than traditional signs. That could be a cost trade off. So if you cannot provide a blank out sign, then you provide more traditional sign and then, then the resources become available. Maybe you can switch on over. So then they talk about some design issues that, that can diminish the effectiveness of the RTOR restriction. So confusing partial prohibition. So this is not a good idea usually. And then again, this relates directly to the human factor, right? Con and, and this relates to what you guys told me about having these confusing deadlines and so forth, right? It's the same exact idea. So confusing partial prohibitions, bad idea because so you might have like something like seven to 9 a.m. and four to 6 p.m. except Sundays. So then the driver's cognitive load increases. Hey, is today Sunday? is what time is it? So you're basically increasing the cognitive activity that the road users have to partake in. And that's usually not a good idea. And then far right sign or hidden NTOR sign, uh, far side or hidden NTOR signs, if they're on the far side of the intersection or if they're not so visible, that's not good either. Long cycle lengths. So if the longer cycle lengths typically are not a good idea because then you're, uh, if you have long cycle lengths, then you're, and then you're restricting right turn on red, you're encouraging drivers to sort of, you know, ignore that. If you have very long cycle lengths and you're providing restrictions on right turn on red, then there, obviously if you have long cycle lengths, meaning you have long red intervals as well. And if you have long red intervals, then you're encouraging uh, some enforcement issues that drivers are just not going to pay attention at that point. On confusing multi-leg intersection, that could be a problem if you have uh, a lot of legs joining, so they can uh, discourage compliance and does not appear to be justified uh, given traffic conditions. NTR that does not appear to be justified given traffic conditions. So if you don't end up in a lot of pedestrian type conflicts and you still uh, drop in that NTOR sign, and there's no justification for it. So for example, there's no pedestrian type conflicts and then you're providing something and people never see pedestrians at that location or people never observe a lot of conflicts with the turning traffic and you're still saying like, oh, you can't make right turn on red, then you lead to compliance issues. And, and that's usually a bad idea. You don't want inconsistent placement of RTOR signs from intersection to intersection. So if you are a jurisdiction, if you're a city agency, if you're a county agency that is in charge of placing those signs, you wanna be consistent with where they're located every time on all intersections, right? And then for each of these case studies or, or countermeasure listings, they provide what we call the cross references, okay? And cross references are some of the portions of the same document that refer to same type of research. So for example, because they talk about, if you look at this countermeasure that I discussed earlier, this countermeasure of 
uh, you know, having an offset stop bar. So offsetting the inside lane stop bar right here, the third column, that relates with side distance. So they talk about some things, or some items that are related with uh, intersection side distance. So they provide some cross references there. And then side distance is right skewed intersection again, because these two sections, these five, six and section 10, eight, they refer to some of the similar research. So they provide some cross reference there because if you're looking for countermeasures for right turn on red, you might want to refer to these guidelines as well because there might be some solution out there for you as a traffic engineer. Okay. So any questions about these specific guidelines? So I'm going to, uh, so again, you can go back to if you, something was not visible, if you want to take a quick review, I will give you another minute to ask any questions you might have about these guidelines. And in the meantime, what I'll try to do is I'm gonna stop share for a minute and I'm gonna go ahead and look for the type of questions you can expect from me in the test or quizzes or exams or surveys that I might ask from these guidelines, okay? So if you give me a minute, think about any questions you might wanna come up with and I can come back and share with you uh, any questions that I might ask you off from these types of guidelines. So, so let's use that time while I'm looking for that question for you. Please use that time to review these guidelines one more time. And if there is anything that does not make sense to you, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to raise that question. I would actually welcome these questions, but because you know, you might be thinking that that question is not the right question to ask or whatever, but chances are there is another student who's thinking the exact same thing. So please give yourself a minute to review this, what we've talked about from this, uh, these two pages and feel free to ask any questions you might have. So in the meantime, I'm gonna locate the questions, the type of questions I might ask you from this. Trying to find real quick a few. So let me go ahead and say, so one of the quiz questions could be, I 
and, and I'm not seeing any questions from you guys, so that's uh, that's fine. But uh, so one of the questions could be the MUTCD restricts or provides six different scenarios where they limit the right turn on red, right? where they provide restrictions on right turns on red by automobile. So I might ask you list two situations where they you know, restrict it. And so, so that could be one quiz question. So when you're reviewing it, again, you don't have to remember all of these because all my quizzes are open note, open quiz or open material. So all you need to know then is that, okay, under which, where in the highway human factor guidelines did they discuss the right turn on red restrictions? And then you can come back to it and, and answer that question. Okay? You won't have time to kind of review that for the first time because you won't have enough time in the quiz to be able to do that. So, so if you've read those things, again, you don't have to memorize anything, but you just have to know where to find that information. And if you've done one of these reviews, you will be able to do that. And then let's see, uh, there might be another question that relates to, so for example, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. My human factor guidelines. <clears throat> Let me go back to my human factor guidelines screen sharing. So I could I could ask you <clears throat> I could show you this picture right here. Uh, I could show you the picture that's on the third column. I'm going to zoom into just this picture. Okay, so I hope you can see that. So so the picture that you're seeing in the middle of your screen, inside lane stop bar is set back to improve sight lines on RTO or vehicles. And I could ask you under what circumstances this countermeasure could be most effective. Okay, so the answer would be when side distances are an issue, when when there is uh, when the vehicle, the right turn on red vehicle has a side distance issue. Okay, so those kind of things. Uh, so again, when you're reviewing these things, it would be helpful for you to have reviewed these things and understood what is the concept behind it but you don't have to memorize anything because you will have access to this human factor guideline. But having reviewed them, all of them at least once would really be helpful to you. Uh, so does that make sense? Uh, does that let you know how you're gonna read through these things and review these things? Not trying to remember everything, but making sense of everything so that you could, if something comes up, if I show you a scenario from these guidelines, you're able to, you're able to answer any questions that relate with that scenario. And some of those questions might be true false type statement. Some of those questions might be short answer type statement, or, or some of those questions might be multiple choice questions. But this is the nature of the question that I'll be asking you, showing you something from these pages or some specific things from these pages and, and be able to answer questions related to that. It will be important for you to have read and understood these things, but you are not having to memorize these things. Okay, any questions about either technical part of this restricting right turn on red or how I might frame some questions? Or maybe you have certain type of questions in mind and you want to ask, could, could, could you ask that type of question? I'll be happy to respond to that as well. Maybe it'll give me some more ideas on what type of questions I may ask. But if you're thinking either in terms of how I might test you on this or, or the technical content itself, any, any questions about that, you're welcome to ask them now. Okay. So I'm not hearing any questions. And obviously you're welcome to ask these questions during office hours and so on and so forth. But let's go back and I wanna review one more of these design guidelines. So I wanna go back to your reading assignment real quick. Go back to your reading assignment. <clears throat> that you're supposed to be done so, so we looked at 11.4. Let me look at 
one of these. Let, let's look at uh, 510, the path. Or maybe let's look at 11.2. I, I think 11.2 also relates with signalized intersection. So let's do 11.2 real quick. So I'm going to go back to 11-2 in our, my NCHR page four. Yep, this is 11.2 right here. And again, this is, you can see that this is based primarily. So this is related to Engineering countermeasures to reduce red light running. So again, we'll do the same format. So I want you to maybe spend five minutes to read through this. So I'm gonna leave you to read this for next five minutes or so. And then I wanna come back and talk about it. And if you're reading this and you run, run into some questions, please let me know, but let's, let's take next five minutes or two. So up until 10.15 to read through this this documentation. So this is talking about looking at these MUTCD guidelines then and kind of enhancing and coming up with some countermeasures to reduce the red light running problem. So go ahead and start reading those. And I will uh, stop the recording and stop the sharing for a few minutes. I'll stop sharing, but you need to re review section 11.2 and join back in five minutes. So. And then just say to everyone, review 11 douche two. So you're basically, when you, as you review this, you're also finishing up your reading assignment. So that's, that's the good thing about it. So review 11 two from the human factor guideline document. And let's reconvene. I will have you guys reconvene and I'll pause. Okay, so we are recording again. Welcome back. Any questions that you observed in reviewing section 11.2? So I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen again in uh, reviewing section 11.2 from HRP report. So I see something in the chat. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So the question that I've gotten is how are traditional traffic light different than LEDs? I think the LEDs are brighter, but then also they are more cost effective in terms of like the energy savings. I think that's another thing, but I haven't actually dug up into the question of if they provide any kind of safety benefits. So I will have to look that up and I'll try to make a note of that. So, so I know the LEDs are from compared to tradition, like they might be more energy, energy efficient. So that might be part of the reason why they're adopted. But I'll have to uh, do a little bit more digging up in terms of if there are benefits of providing LEDs in terms of the safety. Okay. And then the other question, the next one is, what do they mean by delay in the first section of the countermeasure? So I'm going to look at that. First section of the countermeasure. <clears throat> right. So, so delay, unnecessary. So yeah. reduce delay through timing if volume to capacity. So what they're trying to get at with the idea of delay is that the red light running is motivated by so the question was asked is like, what do they mean by delay in this first engineering countermeasure? What do they mean by delay in the first engineering countermeasure? And the, the idea of delay, so what they're trying to get at is they are trying to say that, they're trying to get to the root cause of why drivers engage in red light running. And one of the causes of that is that drivers are trying to get through the intersection or even bicycle riders, whoever, the road users in general are trying to get through the intersection as fast as possible. And they're trying to minimize their own delays. 
and a good cause, or a, not a good cause, but a root cause, a root cause of red light running is the delays that are incurred at the signalized intersection. So they are saying is that if you try to reduce delay by certain measures, if the drivers experience lower amount of the overall delay, it will reduce their tendency to do red light running. So, so that's why they have certain countermeasures. If reduced delay through retiming, especially if the volume to capacity ratio is more than 70%, reduce unnecessary delays to signal retiming. So that could may, may, might mean that you sort of synchronize some signals together so that if you got one green at one intersection, you get a continuous green wave and things like that. So, and then provide green extension and that could all be, so there are a lot of, so even some of these countermeasures that don't measure or don't mention the term delay, they could actually relate with reducing the delay on those intersections. Okay, so I hope that was clear. Let me know if it wasn't. But they're trying to get that the root cause of why drivers do red light running, and partly that is reducing delay could help those maps. Okay, so any other questions? So this is sort of the last one that I'm going through, and that the rest of them are that are part of your reading assignment. You're going to have to go over them yourselves. So I hope this kind of reading through it together kind of give you that practice. So in the intersection, they talk about red light running refers to drivers entering a signal line intersection when the red light is on. And there are several have been proposed uh, and then they provide some references. Uh, these one and two, they are like uh, the references that address some of those things. Most of these countermeasures they're saying are supported by empirical research. So you can see that if you look at that sliding scale, that goes all the way up to five sixths of the way. So, so, so you could say that yeah, they're more based on empirical data. Most of them are based on empirical data. And then there could be a lot of different type of countermeasures that you could do. You could do it with motorist information, signal operation improvement, and then the operations are geometry type, geometry design changes. So some of those could be, uh, you know, and this is where sort of, you know, you have to kind of go back to signal warrants as well. So if you're seeing a lot of red light running, maybe there is a requirement to kind of at least review, maybe there's a need to review whether a signal was necessary at that location in the first place. So there might be, so sometimes the uh, steps as drastic as removing the unneeded signals might be might be useful. And then they provide these countermeasures. And then they talk, talk about discussions. And you know, uh, you know, th these discussions and some design issues that, that are associated with that. And then because red light running kind of directly relate with the yellow timing interval, because if you provide yellow timing, uh, a slightly longer yellow interval, you can reduce red light running and that could be helpful and that's why the cross reference for this is section 11.6 that is selecting of the yellow timing interval and then several driver related factors and driver behavior are relevant to driver uh, you know uh, <clears throat> driver related uh, issues one thing that they want to i want to mention here is that they this is a particularly controversial one, the adding of the red light run, running enforcement cameras. And let me see if they provide any discussion on that. So in Bonenson and Zimmerman, this is the reference, integrated view of past analysis and research was conducted to identify engineering countermeasure for having promises for reducing red light violation at intersection so, so they're only talking about intersection. And, and this point might be obvious, right? So, so that the red light runners that are intentional, they are most affected by enforcement countermeasures, while unintentional red light running measures or red light runners are most affected by engineering countermeasures, right? So that's, that sort of is kind of obvious, but 
they, that bears it out from that that bears out from the research that has been conducted in the area is that enforcement helps with people who are running red light intentionally, while the engineering measures help with the thing that are uh, you know the folks with that are running the red light unintentionally, right? And then the one last thing I want to talk about is the idea of enforcement, right? And there has been like a lot of controversy around it because sometimes the revenue of the camera installation and operation companies is dependent on how many tickets they issue. And those kind of practices are very shady in nature. I think on the part of the cities, also on part of the, those companies. And that could be highly problematic. Uh, but red light cameras are employed as countermeasures. And one of the studies did an empirical base before and after approach. And this is sort of the gold standard of how you evaluate the effectiveness of a countermeasure. The red light running, so they based on very detailed research, they found that red light cameras were in fact associated with decreased right angle and increased rear end crashes. And aggregate cross benefits associated with the use of red light cameras. Right? So there is some benefit to that. However, I'm also familiar with some research where they talked about that if you sort of reduce, so some cities and, and there is some, and I can, I don't wanna point out the specific research at this point because I don't wanna name the specific city, but there was a large metropolitan area in a city where they, introduced these red light cameras. And at the same time, they reduced the red, yellow, yellow interval. And that was a bad idea because that, was, that approach was driven by revenue maximization rather than improving safety. And I think there were some legal challenges that, they, that were presented by road users. And I think ultimately they had to, I believe ultimately that city had to sort of remove red light cameras. Right, so, so you have to be careful if as an agency or as an engineer, you're going to with red light cameras, there's research that bears out and tells you that these red light cameras are in fact effective in reducing red light running. But if you try to parlay that and kind of play, try to play that revenue game by issuing more tickets, by reducing the yellow light interval at the same time, that might have safety implications but also that might have legal implications where your whole program of installation of red light cameras might become in jeopardy. And that would definitely have worse safety implications. So, so you have to be careful as a city that you are keeping safety in mind and you're accounting for human factors and you're not trying to sort of issue more tickets with these red light cameras. Okay? So that is a very important lesson that comes out from these design issues that you know, you, you have to be uh, <clears throat> looking at, you know, a lot more things and, and not making sure that, you know, you, you have to be focused, you have to focus yourself on the safety issues and human factors rather than trying to give out more tickets because that might actually have adverse safety impact. Okay. So, yeah, that's all I want to talk about here. Are there any questions about this? And a lot of these things are not really complicated to understand. They are relatively simple to understand. So you're welcome to sort of uh, look at these things on your own and read through all the case studies and um, the human factor guidelines. And be prepared, like come prepared before the next class. I might have, because I'm, I, I did suggest that there might be some pop-up quizzes. And these quizzes are obviously gonna be open notes and you will have plenty of time to discuss these but you will have a much easier time taking these pop-up quizzes that might start starting next week sometime. And you will have much easier time with those if in fact you have read through these things. So at least give, like, give yourself maybe hour, hour and a half set aside to at least review the reading assignment before the next class, uh, before the coming Tuesday. And I did indicate with the reading assignment that those reading assignments have to be completed by 8 a.m. on Tuesday before we meet for our next class, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. So 
I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen now. Okay, so one of the questions that came up was like, what quizzes we typically given at the beginning of the class. I'll try not to do that because I know sometimes there might be some connection issues and so forth. So what I'll do is the quizzes typically will be on Canvas. And what will happen is that the beginning of the class, not at the beginning of the class, sort of in the middle of the class, what I'll do is I'll have the quizzes there and I'll leave them open for like, you know, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever is the timeline, I'll just give you some extra time to do the quizzes. And when I assign a quiz, I'll typically uh, drop an email at the same time. So I will sort of have the quizzes on, I'll announce that in our Zoom session, and then you can go back and start taking the quiz. And at the same time, what I'll do is I'll drop an email right as I'm giving the time. So if, you, if you're not on class for whatever reason, maybe you'll have one opportunity to kind of come back to the class, join the class, or at least join Canvas and take that quiz. And again, like if you miss one quiz, it's not the end of the world. So just try to be present, try to do the best you can. And if you do badly in one quiz or if you miss one quiz, that won't be the end of the world. As I said before, grading is not the most important thing. It's important that you learn the material, you go over the material, that is the most important thing. I'm having these quizzes just because I know it gives the students as an incentive to review the material. But don't think of these quizzes as the end of the world if you miss one or if you do badly in one. But typically, I'll give those out in the middle of the class. Any other questions so far? Okay, so one last thing I want to do in the class is that just make sure that, you know, uh, maybe I'll share my screen again and and show you what, what's coming up and what you need to wrap up in the class. So if you go back to, go back to our Canvas page. <clears throat> go back to our Canvas page here. And I'm gonna change that to student view so that I'm seeing what you see typically. So if you can input those best practices, if you have any about the overall classes, please do so by January 7th. So this will help, so, so that's today, so before the end of the class today, so you still have half an hour to input any feedback. And again, this is not a mandatory assignment. So if you don't have anything to share, that's fine. But if you do have something to share, please do so by 11 o'clock today. So can, I can start incorporating that in my session starting next week. And this is something we'll cover in the next class. Uh, so, so we don't have to worry about this right now. But <clears throat> so your reading assignment is due by 8 a.m. This is the red light running camera and revenue article. You don't have to read through it right now, but I will go over this, uh, this red light running camera and revenues article in the next class. And I did touch upon that issue today a little bit. But your next assignment is essentially just making sure that you provide me with the best practices by, by the end of the class today, so within the next half an hour or so. And then make sure that you are get, uh, getting up on that reading assignment. Okay? And then there is one more assignment that's up. That's uh, you know basically what you would like to cover based on what you've seen in the syllabus. If there are some topics that you want me to cover in the class that are not already included in the syllabus, please let me know. Uh, so, but that you have some time for. So you, you know, you might come across some safety things, or as you're reviewing class material, you might think that, hey, it'd be nice to learn about this stuff in this class. So please let me know, but you still have some time to do that. That's due by January 28th. So there's still uh, a lot of time left for that. But I would like you to, to do that by, uh, by the 28th Thursday, end of the class on Thursday. Okay, and I'll keep reminding you of this so you don't have to worry about this right now. Okay, so I will stop here now unless there are some more questions that have come up. Please feel free to ask them via chat or via audio, whatever you prefer. I'll give it another minute or so. 
and then we can start uh, adjourning and stop recording. I'll not stop recording just yet, so maybe there's some good question that comes up, but if not, then... Okay. So if there are any questions about the mechanics of the class or any material that we covered today, please feel free to ask them. If not, we can we can start adjourning and you can you can uh, you're free to leave and I'm gonna stop recording then. <laughs>